Potter, Chapter 3. Chapter 3, Cycles of Water, Cycles of Life. According to a theory first proposed by Lewis Frank at Ohio State University and confirmed by NASA and the University of Hawaii, water arrived on this earth after traveling through space. In every minute of the day, about 12 comets, some as heavy as 100 tons, fall to earth. These comets are made up mostly of ice. When the ice reaches the atmosphere, it forms clouds and eventually falls to earth in the form of rain to fill the ocean. And since we are mostly water, in a sense, we all come from outer space. You've probably gone outside on a clear night to lie on your back and look up at the stars. Did you ever experience a feeling like nostalgia, maybe memories of long ago? When you gaze at the heavens, your soul is taken back in time millions and billions of years. Do you ever get the feeling that you yourself are somehow floating up there in the cosmos, like a planet of one? It makes a lot of sense that we would be so eternally and universally enchanted by the heavens. From the time when Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut, first broke the earthly shackles in 1961 and Neil Armstrong made one giant leap for mankind, the possibility that you and I might someday make the journey ourselves has steadily become more of a reality. Scientists currently have their sights set on Mars. NASA is already working on concrete plans to send a manned spaceship to Mars, paving the way for people like you and me to become aliens on a distant planet. But traveling to Mars presents several challenges, and here again the solution may well be found in water. Among the risk of space travel is the weakening of muscle and bone due to the lack of gravity, not to mention the mental stress of spending long periods in isolation. Cosmic radiation is another problem. Space is filled with radiation from distant universes as well as from the solar flares of the sun, which can be especially harmful. Safe space travel requires close observation of the sun and a way to escape the intense radiation as needed. Such a place would need thick and sturdy walls. One way that NASA is addre addressing this obstacle is by working on building a room in a spaceship with walls made of columns of water. The water could be used for consumption and for preparing water-based foods and for protection. When a solar flare occurs, the water in the columns would act as a shield for the voyagers until the danger passes. Because the weight of a spaceship must be kept to a minimum, only a limited amount of water can be carried. The average person uses about 180 liters of water a day. On a space vessel, this amount can be reduced to 3 liters, but even that small amount would add up quickly for a crew on a long journey. This is where recycling of water becomes an important issue. Systems are now being developed to effectively recycle the water used for drinking and bathing and even to recycle sweat and urine. When the NASA probe Odyssey touched down on Mars in May 2001, they discovered that large volumes of water existed in the form of ice just beneath the planet's surface, meaning that water existed on the surface of the planet at some period in the distant past. If this frozen water can be used, then it opens up the possibility that this planet can be made green like our own so that people can someday inhabit it. Work is now moving ahead to make this a possibility. In 1996, NASA conducted an experiment on Devon Island in Canada to simulate, sim, simulate life on Mars. The experiment studied biological scenarios, living conditions, and telecommunications. The temperature on Devon Island is low and the land is barren, not unlike the environment of Mars. Scientists were studying the feasibility of space colonization, but there are other implications of the experiment. Our planet is deteriorating at a rapid rate and no one has a definitive solution for global warming, overpopulation, starvation, pollution, and water. At the end of the book, I'll show the pictures. They're pretty. And water shortages. 
It makes one wonder how long our own planet will remain friendly and inhabitable. Will we someday be faced with the realization that the only way we will survive as a species is by moving to a distant planet such as Mars? It is no small problem. Understanding water's remarkable journey to and through our planet may bring us closer to the answers we are searching for. Water's Adventures on Planet Earth Imagine you have just returned from a trip into space. You step off your vessel onto our green planet and find yourself standing in a deep green forest. Rays of light filter through the trees towering above you. Fallen leaves soften the ground and deep green moss envelops the trunk of a fallen tree. Ferns cover the ground all around you. The sounds of life permeate the air, the flapping of wings, the calling of birds, and the wind whistling through the trees and shaking the leaves. As you take a deep breath of cool air and let the sense of pristine nature fill your body, you have a deep realization that this is your planet and your birthright, and that is why you must love it and why you do. You now see water trickling out between rocks, forming a pool of water. You cup your hands together and drink. You feel the energy of the earth filling your soul, and you know it's because of all that water has experienced in its secret life. Where did this water, arising from the bosom of the earth, come from? Think for a moment about the earth as water has experienced it. Arriving from the cosmos in the form of clumps of ice, water fell from the sky upon mountains and forests to give moisture to the trees. That first droplet of dew on a leaf is water in its infancy. From there it begins a journey of unforeseen adventures on our planet. After water falls in the form of rain, what happens next? A good portion of rainwater, one third of all that falls, seeps into the ground where it's absorbed by plants, again to be evaporated into the atmosphere. In evergreen forest, as much as ten tons of water will evaporate from a square hectare, approximately two and a half acres, in the first few moments after a downpour. The water will then rise into the air as mist that drifts among the trees, or it will rise even higher to form clouds. Water in the form of mist will sometimes take another path. When the temperature drops below the freezing point, the mist touches down on the leaves and flowers and forms a thin white layer of ice on the plants in the ground. It's hard to find anything more beautiful than dew on flower petals and leaves. Clear, crystal-like dew is loved by the plants. A single drop of dew falls off the tip of a sprouting leaf on a branch and makes its descent through the forest canopy and lands on the back of a frog. Thus in the forest morning, water spreads itself about in multiple forms to shower love on the frog and the new sprout and to be loved in return. Just as a mother instinctively loves her newborn, water in infancy is loved by all of nature. After falling as rain or forming as dew onto the ground, what is water's next destination? Some water will be taken in by the roots of plants and then evaporate again into the atmosphere, but much more will seep slowly into the ground and begin an incredibly long leg of the total journey. Its main path will be the infinite number of secret tunnels under our feet. The ground is filled with spaces of air such as the tiny tunnels created by creatures out of our sight. Earthworms, centipedes, spiders, beetles, bugs, mites, countless microorganisms, along with moles, rabbits, and other animals. All these creatures serve to soften the soil by opening spaces in the ground in every direction. Spaces between rocks and sand and openings left by melted ice, rotted roots, dehydrated soil, and cracked stones all serve as possible pathways for water on its incredible journey. Water moves through layers of sand and clay and bedrock. Its journey downward is unwearied and profound. Depending on the hardness of the ground, it's not uncommon for water to move as little as 30 centimeters in a year's time. Deep within the earth, when water finally reaches hard clay or bedrock, the droplets of water come together and flow into streams, sometimes becoming rivers or lakes, such as those that exist above the ground and have names we know. From the time when water left on this journey through the ground early in its infancy, it has gained experience and knowledge and has formed a personality, depending on its path in life, much as a person's personality is formed by his or her journey. 
Water that has experienced cold, for example, has knowledge of calcium and magnesium, which is why we call it hard water. And water that has experienced granite is mostly left unchanged by minerals and is known as soft water. Eventually, water learns all it can from the ground and is ready for the next stage in life. Out of darkness, it moves upward toward the light above ground. And then after untold adventures and experiences, water emerges into the light. From the ground's crevices rises water, cold and pure. From a tiny spring, water merges with other water, fallen fresh from the sky, and water permeating the soil to form a small stream that makes its way downward until eventually a river is born. The river builds momentum and eats away at layers of soil and ground as the flow slowly widens and deepens, like a bright-eyed child emerging from infancy. The river becomes strong enough to carve away at a mountain or even to create a canyon, but the carving away of hard rocks and ground is not accomplished by water alone. Most of this work is accomplished by the gravel and sand caught up in the flow of the water. These small particles carried along by water carve away at the surrounding land and bring in even larger rocks and stones, building enough strength to eventually carve away even the largest of stones. The river begins to develop characteristics that give the river its reputation. While one river becomes dark brown from the earth it carries with it, another one flows clean and pure, and still another roars downward, smashing against rock and stone. In its downward journey, water witnesses a great deal. It might witness salmon migrating upstream, deer, bears, squirrels, and other creatures, gather on its banks to quench their thirst, and trees brought down by a storm might even alter its flow. The river eventually comes to gentler reaches, and now it flows gently as it winds along like an enormous snake crawling boldly across a plain. Never satisfied with its current course, the river will continue to change, at one point widening and letting sediment accumulating into a sandbank, and then later narrowing to grind its way past stone. If we could see the passage of ages and seconds, we would see just how much rivers turn and twist over time. Most rivers plot their courses so slowly that it defies human measurement, but there are some that shift relatively quickly. The Mississippi River, for example, has been known to shift by more than 20 meters in a single year. After a river has shifted, the sand and soil it carries often accumulates and forms natural banks. Then a flood will come and wash away the bank, pushing the sediment onto the flat land. These flood plains become fertile land that gives birth to civilizations. The Egyptian Empire arose among the fertile flood plain of the Nile. So while floods are considered natural disasters, they also provide land with nourishment that civilizations require to establish themselves and grow. When water encounters human beings, it has even more to witness. An old man crossing a bridge, a young girl on her bicycle, a couple sitting and watching the river flow. Ever slowly and ever gently, the river watches children playing in the park on its banks and a father and son playing catch. The river, now in its twilight years, becomes ever more gentle as it inches toward the sea. Then the moment comes when it finally touches the sea and the flowing of water finally comes to an end. All the sediment carried by the water is then dropped into the estuary of the river. The result is the formation of a delta. The Ganges, the Mississippi, and the Amazon rivers have all formed great broom-like deltas at the points where they enter the ocean. What must have started as a small sandbank eventually grew into a great expanse of land creating a new and spacious coastline. These fertile deltas form some of the greatest agricultural regions in the world, the final gift that water has to offer humankind, before at the end of its life it gives itself up to the ocean. But this is not really the end of life for water, for the ocean is also teeming with life, and together with all the creatures of the sea, water is even now just beginning. In the process of eternal rebirth, water is there to give us a full account of all its wisdom and experience. In a cycle that we would count as eternity, water travels the path from above the earth to the tips of mountains and to the depths of the ocean, carrying life within its bosom and linking everything together in perfect balance. 
As water makes its journey through life, it becomes a witness to all of life on earth, becoming itself the flow of life. For the second collection of water crystal photographs in this book, we took photographs of water collected at various points along water's cycle, from the source to the bottom reaches of rivers. We also exposed water to various photographs of nature and plants to see how the water would reveal itself through crystals. Within the crystals can be seen the reflection of life. Let water flow. Much of human history has been set along the banks of rivers. The great cultural hearths of civilization have all developed along the banks of rivers. The Nile, the Tigris and Euphrates, the Indus and the Yellow River. And wherever explorers have traveled, they searched for water along their way. From the days of the horse-drawn carriage to the automobile, rivers have observed the workings of our race. Today people continue to walk along the banks of rivers, talking with friends, looking at the flowing water, and speaking their hopes and dreams. But now, armed with technology and knowledge, we work to change the very flow of water under the belief that the result will yield great benefits for humankind. And we have succeeded, or so it would seem. In 1971, construction on the Nile River of the Aswan High Dam, 3.6 kilometers across and 110 meters high, was completed. Its construction had required the relocation of the enormous and ancient temple of Abu Simbel, along with 100,000 people who lived in the area. The completion was met with cheers of joy. Mankind had finally conquered the Nile, putting an end to a long history of flooding, while also producing enough electricity for a quarter of Egypt's population. But gradually it became clear what the river really had provided. After being dammed, the Nile was no longer capable of nourishing the once fertile farmland at the Delta. Irrigation systems were implemented, and for the first time chemical fertilizers were used. Irrigation raised the salt density and deteriorated the quality of the topsoil. Puddles and pools of water formed on the delta, becoming a breeding ground for harmful insects and causing great harm to nearby residents. The delta plain itself has even started to sink. Scientists soon noticed that the fish population in the dam were becoming infected with mercury as the water from the mountain valleys drained into the dam. Plant life buried by the dam became the perfect breeding ground for bacteria. As this bacteria absorbed the mercury in the ground, it became a highly toxic bacteria containing methyl mercury. The density in the eco ecosystem steadily rose until it entered the bodies of fish in alarming amounts. The annual flooding of the Nile may have made life along its shores difficult for humans, but it was an integral part of the life cycle for many other creatures. The dam squelched the vast ecosystem that nature had taken hundreds of thousands of years to form. Similar effects are seen in other parts of the world when rivers are dammed. In Canada, high levels of mercury have been found in hair samples of the Cree Indians living around the James Bay and Peace River since the lake where they fished was dammed up to make a reservoir for generating electricity. The same phenomenon can be seen in other parts of Canada as well. These are examples of what can happen when we choose to block or change the flow of water. The time has come for us to put on the brakes and think. Always keep in mind water's pure natural journey, and you will see how we as humans fit into this delicate cycle of life. We are part of the flow, and we need to respect it. We have seen how water shows its love by showering its gifts onto flowers, trees, birds, insects, and all the small creatures of nature as it flows along its path. In return, water is loved by all of nature. It's time that we return to the cycle. When you have learned to love nature from the bottom of your heart, then you too will be ready to be loved by nature. The earth knows how to answer our most earnest prayers. When you pray, the earth responds, then love spreads to all life and to water. <clears throat> Chapter 4, The Wonder of Hado, Explaining the Inexplicable. Long ago at the top of a distant mountain lived an old shaman. So began a tale told to me by an old aborigine with a white scraggly mustache and a face darkened by time. He's in his late eighties, but no one, not even himself or his family, knows his exact age. Wisdom and knowledge accumulated over the decades is as deep as the wrinkles in his face. 
I was on my first lecture trip to Australia in August 2002 when I was introduced to Eric, the Aborigine elder. We met at a restaurant, and I presented him with a collection of my photographs of water crystals. He looked at it slowly and intently, and then he began to tell me an ancient tale passed down for generations. This evil shaman lived at the top of Mount Ridge in the northern region now known as New South Wales. A river runs down the mountain, and the shaman lived near the upper reaches of the river. One day she looked down on the river valley and saw all the happy people who lived along the banks of the river. The sight of all this happiness filled her heart with resentment, and she copied her thoughts into the water. She filled the river with spite and the desire that only she would be happy. She also blocked up the river so only a trickle of water reached the people. The riverbed where pure water once freely ran became filled with filth. The people who lived along the banks of the river soon became sick, and thievery, bickering, and fighting became rampant because of the evil thoughts copied into the water by the shaman. Years of pain and sorrow passed, then one day a young shaman in the valley went for a walk with his dog. The dog chased after a kangaroo it saw, and the shaman waited for a long time for his dog to return. When the dog finally returned, he was dripping wet with pure water, not the foul water from the river. Wanting to know where the pure water came from, the young shaman followed his dog up the mountain to the doorstep of the evil shaman's house. Nearby, the young shaman saw where the pure water of the river had been blocked. The young shaman turned the evil shaman into water, and in a moment she was washed down by the river. They say that the rugged fissures at the far reaches of the river were caused by the evil shaman clawing at the edges, trying to save herself from being washed out to sea. Just in time, she grabbed hold of a big rock. The young shaman spoke to her and said, I will save your life if you change your ways. Stay where you are now and promise to work for the good of people. The evil shaman promised to do so, and she became a large tree growing on top of the rock. The people along the riverbank were finally able to go back to living happy and peaceful lives. The old shaman in the form of a tree stood along the river to warn the people to stay away from the dangerous ledges. Listening to Eric's story, I was surprised to hear the phrase copied into the water. I then realized that this was in complete accordance with the principle of Hato. I would never have imagined that this phrase would be found within a story handed down from generation to generation for thousands of years, but I should have realized that the more years one has lived, the more likely one is to know that such things are possible. It was quite unexpected that I would hear such a story about water in such a distant corner of the world. Like the myths and fables of other countries and cultures, those of the Aborigines in Australia are rich in truths about the universe and the ways in which life should be lived. From the fable told by the Elder, we learn that water must always flow. When the flow is stopped, then the river will die. We also learn that jealousy and greed have the power to destroy that which is good, an appropriate message for the times we live in. Yet another lesson is that water has the ability to read emotions and to spread the halo of such emotions to the rest of the world. In other words, the messages that water carries throughout the world depends on each one of us, for better or worse. For our ancestors, fantasy, science, and theology were all one and the same, and the way to pass on the truths of the world to future generations was through stories. Such stories were based on an understanding of the invisible laws that govern the visible world. The advanced medical practitioners were the shamans who prayed for and healed the afflicted, such as the role of water crystals. In fact, my journey toward water crystal research was born out of a desire to heal. I was first introduced to the strange and wonderful world of Hado more than 15 years ago. I had just set up my company, IHM, Originally International Health Medical, now Interna International HADO Membership, and was importing a low-frequency medical device used to alleviate pain from the United States. My contact in the States was a biochemist named Dr. Lee H. Lorenzen. I learned that Dr. Lorenzen's wife had been quite ill. He had done all he could think of to restore her health, but nothing seemed to work. He finally decided to consider water. He formed a team of scientists specializing in electronics and physics with the goal of developing the best water possible. They started their research with the proposition that water had the ability to transfer information. 
I heard from Dr. Lorenzen that they had actually found this water. Then one day I had the opportunity to see for myself what the water could do. Under the bright blue skies of California, I was playing golf with Dr. Lorenzen and two of the researchers working with him when my left ankle started to ache from an old rugby injury. The other three noticed that I was limping and were concerned. When we finally got back to the clubhouse, one of the men handed me a small plastic container with water in it. They instructed me to apply the water to the area around my ankle. I knew on one level that water couldn't remove pain, but I also knew that it couldn't hurt either, so I applied the water to my swollen ankle. To my amazement, my foot no longer hurt when I walked on it, nor even when I stretched it out. I couldn't help but become interested in this strange water. In Japan at that time, there was widespread interest in various types of water that claimed to be good for the health. So I signed a contract to introduce this technology to Japan, and I invited Dr. Lorenzen and the two researchers to seminars in three of the largest cities in the country. At all three locations, perhaps because there was no charge to get in, the halls were overflowing with people, but I soon learned that the explanation of water's healing abilities was far too difficult for most people to grasp. I myself could hardly understand what the scientists were describing. Some people got up and left partway through, many others nodded off in their chairs. It was pretty much a disaster. Afterward, I reflected on what went wrong. I realized that water is essential to human life in so many ways, and yet we really don't understand much about it. Around that time, when I was still thinking about what to do next, I heard something that made sense to me. Science is based on first forming a hypothesis, and then using instruments and technology to prove the hypothesis. Then it hit me, all sorts of instruments and technology can be used to analyze chemicals and other materials, so why isn't there anything that can be used to analyze water? I wasted no time in calling Dr. Lorenzen to ask him to look for a device of some type that we could use to analyze water. This led to my encounter with the MRA device that analyzes and transfers HADO. Since bringing this device to Japan in 1987, I have had the pleasure of working with as many as 15,000 people who have come to me with concerns about their health. I have written more than 10 books about Hado and the many miraculous cases I witnessed. Over the years, scores of people have tried to imitate this Hado machine and have made similar devices to analyze Hado, creating a type of Hado fad in Japan. Vast numbers of people have become interested in learning about the unseen world of Hado. This movement has the energy to take us into a new age and open the door to a new stage of our evolution. Understanding Hado gives us a better understanding of how our world works, and it also gives us hope for the future. I sometimes even think that knowing the possibilities of Hado is like possessing a golden lamp that can make the impossible possible. Then at other times I feel that the more I understand Hado, the more there is to understand about what's going on around us. Photographing crystals is a subjective science. To gain the understanding and support of as many people as possible, I have approached my research as scientifically as possible. But we can't forget that not everything can be understood by research or science. The photographs of water crystals present to us a majestic fantasy world, but this is a fantasy world that has much to teach us, for sometimes fantasy is the best way to get a clear picture of reality. When water is frozen, the same crystal will never appear twice, just as there are no two snowflakes that are exactly alike. When I show slides of crystals at lectures, I am often asked, if no two crystals are alike, how do you choose one particular crystal photograph? It's a good question. Of course, it would be impossible to show you all the hundreds of photographs we take of all the crystals, but then again, I don't see why this should cause grave concern. It would be like looking at an encyclopedia of animals and questioning how the picture of one particular dog could possibly represent all the different dogs of that species. When I choose a photograph for a collection, I make a choice based on the photograph of the crystal that most accurately represents the crystals made under a certain set of circumstances. In The True Power of Water, I briefly described how we photograph water crystals. I'd like to add more details to that explanation. If we are testing the effects of water of if we are testing the effects on water of words, photographs, or music, 
We begin with distilled water <clears throat> and then expose the water to whatever influence we are testing for the appropriate amount of time. If we are testing water from a source such as a lake, we do not expose it to any outside influence such as words or music. We simply use the water as is. To photograph water crystals, we put 0.5 cc of water into about 50 petri dishes using a syringe. Then we freeze the petri dishes to minus 25 degrees centigrade and take photographs through a microscope. Of course, the result is never 50 similar crystals in the 50 petri dishes. When we have the photographs, we divide them into eight categories. Beautiful, rather beautiful, hexagonal pattern, radial pattern, lattice pattern, indefinite pattern, collapsed pattern, and no crystal formation. This classification helps to give us a general idea of the type of crystals formed. Let's take, for example, the crystals made from water collected from the Hanmyo River, shown on pages 185 to 186. A flowing river and blocked off water. At the edge of the Ariac Sea, where the Hanmyo River empties into Isahaya Bay, a land reclamation project is taking place despite protests from local citizens. We collected river water from the source to the reclamation area. Crystal at the source of the river, upper reaches of the river. At the source, the water creates an almost transparent crystal, and water from the upper reaches of the river revealed a breathtaking crystal. Water flowing through the city. Water right before it reaches the bay. Pond in a planned land reclamation area. As the water moves along, it becomes polluted until crystal formation becomes difficult or even impossible. At the land reclamation site where the water has been diverted, the puddle water resulted in a tragic looking crystal. When water is prevented from flowing, it dies. When we took water from the river before it runs into the Isahaya Bay and the Ariaki Sea, we found that the crystals were broken and no complete hexagonal crystals formed. The results were as follows. Beautiful zero, redder beautiful zero, hexagonal pattern zero, radial pattern two, Lattice pattern 6, indefinite pattern 29, collapsed pattern 2, no crystal formation 11. This shows us that no crystal formations appeared in 11 of the petri dishes, and when crystals did form, they were broken. There was not a single crystal that could be considered beautiful. Based on this, we then chose a crystal that we felt best represents the array of samples, an indefinite pattern in this case. Let's next look at the example of crystals formed from water collected near the source of the Hanmyo River. The results were as follows. Beautiful 2, redder beautiful 4, hexagonal pattern 0, radial pattern 4, lattice pattern 8, indefinite pattern 29, collapsed pattern 3, no crystal formation 0. In this case, we chose a beautiful crystal to represent the sample. Of course, there were only two beautiful crystals in the sample of 50, but when such crystals appear from a sample, there are also usually many crystals that are classified as redder beautiful, hexagonal pattern, radial pattern, and lattice pattern. This indicates that there are many formations that are in the process or have the potential to make beautiful crystals. Considering that crystals easily form from this particular sample of water, we can justifiably choose a beautiful crystal to represent the sample. I admit that the selection process is not strictly in accordance with the scientific method, but simply put, we chose the crystal that best represents the entire sample instead of simply one from the most common category. And the whim of the person doing the selecting certainly comes into play. When making the selection for a collection of crystal photographs, it is best if one person chooses all the photographs for consistency, which is why all the photographs in this book were selected by me. In fact, the crystals in the photographs that we take are affected by such factors as the environment, the timing, and even the personality and thoughts of the photographer, 
This is not unlike the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. The uncertainty principle was first put forth by a German physicist named Werner Heisenberg, and it is said to have completed the science of quantum mechanics. The theory says that each time you look at electrons, they move in a different way. In other terms, the very act of observing results in a differing movement of the electrons, making observation impossible. The reason for this is that human observation requires light, and when electrons are exposed to light electrons, the electrons are disrupted, making their direction impossible to predict. This means that we know very little about what is going on in the world around us. When this theory was first presented to the scientific community, it apparently came as quite a shock. The same principle applies to water. It changes its form completely depending on the person doing the observing. Water's reaction will differ depending on whether the heart of the observer is filled with appreciation or with anger, and this difference is reflected in the formation of the crystals. Another factor that makes the observation of crystals even more difficult is that the form changes moment by moment for the two-minute life of the crystal. The crystal will look quite a bit different depending on when the shutter is pushed. Uncertainty truly is a factor in everything in our world. The sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening. That is one thing we can count on. But if you consider the long history of the universe, this phenomenon is something that has continued for only a short time, and it's something that won't go on forever. After some five billion years, the sun will gradually expand and eventually consume the earth, and that too is just a part of the process that the sun, which lights our world today, is going through. What's in there five billion years of earth time when talking about the forever time of the universe? The methods employed to photograph, to photograph water crystals might not pass everyone's definition of being scientific, and there is a degree of uncertainty involved. In fact, there is much about the world of Hato that is murky and that cannot be explained by the black and white standards of statistical analysis. But when you think about it, all any scientist can do anyway is lift up one small corner of the veil that covers the truth of this world and then try to express it with words that the general population can stretch their minds around. Everything emits Hato. Another question that I'm frequently asked is, how could exposing water to a picture or words possibly result in crystals that are so different from each other? Even I must admit that this is a difficult question to answer. I first got the idea of exposing water to words and photographs before I even thought about taking photographs of water crystals. I was experimenting with the Hado machine I mentioned previously. When people suffering from health problems came to my office for consultation, I would test and analyze their Hado and recommend water as one treatment. The water would be infused with Hado to counteract their illness. If they were too ill to leave their bed, I would print out the person's name and then test the Hado from the name, or I would test the Hado of their photograph. The scores of instances where the ill person healed convinced me that even photographs have their own Hado. To read more about these cases, please refer to The True Power of Water. You might refer to this Hado as something like a desire. There are people, but not many, who are able to detect the halo emitted by photographs and thus are able to sense if a missing person is dead or alive from a photograph in the newspaper. Even people who would never admit to believing in such special powers may experience having a premonition and then later learn that their premonition was valid. An acquaintance of mine said he remembered reading about a mountain climber who had reached the top of Mount Everest. When he looked at the picture of the climber, he sensed that the climber was no longer alive. Not long after, he heard on the news that the climber was lost and presumed dead. It's hard to deny that somewhere buried deeply within the human consciousness, there is a hidden power, perhaps intuition, to sense what has happened despite the barriers of time and distance. The same thing can also be said of words. There's an ancient belief in Japan that each individual word has its own spirit, which makes it possible for messages to be transferred and information relayed. When water is exposed to words such as thank you and you idiot, we can see that the water accurately captures the characteristics of these words. 
But when words are spoken to water, the meaning of the words changes significantly with the speaker's intonation and, and inflection. The words, you idiot, can have completely different meanings depending on whether they're said with deep felt hatred or in jest. But with words written on paper, the way the word is said is not a factor, and the pure energy of the word is able to reveal itself in the formation of the crystal. No matter how often or how deeply you consider it, consider it, it remains remarkable, almost unbelievable, that the messages of water are able to pass through the barriers of time and space. The fact that a photograph contains information indicates that consciousness is involved. When you see a photograph of a landscape and think it's beautiful, or a picture of a friend that brings back old memories, the photograph is appealing to your consciousness. In the same way an ID photo serves as ID, because of the awareness that the picture represents the actual person. A psychology professor at Yale University conducted an experiment a while back. He chose several words from Hebrew and then he simply made up an equal number of words. Next he mixed all the words together, showed them to subjects who didn't know Hebrew, and had them guess the, meaning of the, the meanings of the words. The subjects, of course, did not know that half of the words were fake. The result was that there were significantly more right guesses for the Hebrew words than for the made-up words. This experiment serves as support for the theories of Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, a scientist who believes that the words which people have used for ages form morphic fields for perception of the meaning of such words. So someone who has never seen a word can guess its meaning with an unexpected degree of accuracy. The morphic field is not anything you can see with the eyes, and it's not an energy that can be measured. It might best be described as another world invisible to the eye. With the formation of a morphic field, there's an increased likelihood that something which happens twice will happen again. This same process can be seen in the unfolding of history. The words that have already been spoken somewhere in the world are somehow easier to learn. To illustrate this idea, let's look at an, exa at an example. On a visit to Germany a while back, I heard an amazing story. A doctor had collected blood samples from several patients and stored them. The doctor said he was able to identify what the patient was ailing from by just looking at his or her blood sample. The samples were sealed and stored to keep them from being contaminated or altered, but two years later when the physician re-examined the patients in the previous samples, he noticed that the components of the blood had changed, and not just randomly. The two-year-old blood was now changed to the same components as the recently re-examined blood. In other words, if a patient was sick two years previously and then healthy after, the two-year-old blood changed to be that of a healthy person and vice versa. The doctor then went on to conduct 2,000 more experiments and to publish the results. I met another doctor, a man in his 80s, in Germany who had conducted a similar experiment. He had used a pendulum to conduct diagnoses by taking a drop of blood from the patient's finger and soaking it into a piece of paper. He said that he could use the same blood stain throughout the treatment of the patient because it continued to change in appearance according to the patient's condition. In other words, a blood stain from two years ago could be used to diagnose the current condition of the patient. The scientific explanation for this, I do not know. How can we interpret the principles of Hato? Think about the three terms, three terms we discussed in the first chapter of this book concerning Hato. First, Hato is vibration. All human beings are in a state of vibration, and the condition of an individual can be understood by examining the vibration of a blood sample from that person. Second, Hato is resonance. Blood taken from a person two years ago remains in resonance with the person's Hato today, changing to match the current status of the blood flowing through the veins now. And third, Hato is similarity. For all Hato, there is a miniature and a macro version, and these versions resonate with each other. In the experiments done in Germany, my interpretation is that the blood sample is a miniature version of the sample's body, changing in unison with the body from whence it came. 
About seven decades ago, a scientist named Harold Saxton Burr laid much of the basic foundation for the science of Hado. Burr was a renowned professor of anatomy at Yale University. In his attempt to understand the mysteries of life, he gave us the term L-field or life field. Since all the cells within our bodies are replaced over a period of six months, why do we keep being reborn as the same person over and over? Like a mold used to make jello, an invisible force enables this to happen, he believed, and he called it the life field. He believed that since the life field is an electrical field in nature, it could be measured, and he even developed his own measuring device using a voltage indicator and an electrode. He discovered that the measurements he took varied with the way the subject was feeling. He got higher voltage readings from subjects who were feeling blissful and lower voltage readings from those feeling depressed. It seems that his device was a forerunner for the MRA device that I used to analyze Hado. By entering various code numbers into the device, it's possible to identify the part of the body that matches the code. When a certain part of your body is suffering, emotional hado is inevitably involved. By using the codes, such emotional hado can also be measured and classified. In his book, Blueprints for Immortality, The Electric Patterns of Life, Dr. Burr wrote that someday it will be possible to pinpoint even the emotions of people using millivolts. Anyone who has worked very much with vibration has noticed at least one thing. The soul is affected by anything, and it affects everything. Both your body and the things that go on around you, and even the world that you live in, is created by your soul. It's something that I have observed over and over. There is so much power within you. Perhaps we do live in a world of uncontrollable and unpredictable chaos. We really don't know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. But this chaos is also of your own creation. Chaos is brimming over with myriad amounts of energy. After all, before heaven and earth, before there was a universe moving in order, there was just one thing, chaos. So if you feel lost, disappointed, hesitant, or weak, return to yourself, to who you are here and now. And when you get there, you will discover yourself, like a lotus flower in full bloom, even in a muddy pond, beautiful and strong. Mm-hmm. <laughs>